Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Let me just uh, share some slides, if I may. Okay, um, can everyone see that? Yep, great. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity and hello to uh, all of you who are out there and listening to us at this late hour on a Thursday. <laughs> I hope it's been uh, an exciting uh, day so far and thank you very much to the organizers for putting this together. So um, as Jessica said, I'm, I'm a professor at the law faculty and uh, my two areas of research are actually in two quite different areas. One is in criminal law, which is what I'm going to be focusing on today. But I also do uh, work in the area of tort law, which is deals with liability, in particular focusing on medical negligence. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about is my interest in the role of the public prosecutor uh, and how the public prosecutor has such a central role in the administration of criminal justice in, in most uh, jurisdictions. I spent two years in the Attorney General's Chambers uh, on secondment uh, to help Chambers to develop uh, guidelines and also to work as a DPP. So during that time, I actually got an insider's view on how things work and what some of the challenges are. So in terms of, as an academic looking at this, my um, the, the key research themes are, are these, right? So what is the role of the public prosecutor? What is the proper role of the public prosecutor? So that's one big question. Uh, the second question uh, relates to the independence of the public prosecutor. And this is really important in the criminal justice system because the public prosecutor, as I will explain, wields considerable power in determining whether to bring charges and how to run a prosecution. So it's vital that the public prosecutor is independent of the government to ensure that there's no bias uh, in the system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then the third thing is, while it is crucial that the public prosecutor is independent of the government, at the same time, the public prosecutor cannot run unchecked. So there must be some way of overseeing the public prosecutor and checking the public prosecutor's uh, powers. So that's, that's, those are some of those complex questions that, that I um, research uh, and have spent uh, quite a number of years now uh, looking at. So in terms of the outline of today's presentation, I'm not gonna go into the details uh, of, of the stuff. I'm just gonna try and set out some of the key themes and, and the flavors. Uh, but understanding that the audience is unlikely to be uh, legally trained, I think it's important to just set a little bit of background so, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so there are three parts really to this presentation. Uh, so I'll first introduce you to public prosecution, the role of the public prosecutor, and what prosecutorial discretion is about, because that's really central to this. The prosecutor exercises discretion. So the second part of it goes into that whole business of how the prosecutor exercises discretion. And then the third part is how do you safeguard that discretionary power? We need it to ensure that the public prosecutor is independent, uh, but we also, as I said, need to uh, find ways of controlling the public prosecutor. Okay, so that's basically an overview of what I want to talk about in the remaining 15 minutes or so, and, and I welcome your questions after that. So just again, very quick, this is criminal law 101 in terms of the criminal process. Uh, you start off with an alleged crime uh, that happens. You have a victim of the crime, makes a complaint to the police. The police then will investigate and then they will prepare a report. And in, in most cases, they will send that report to the public prosecutor's office for the public prosecutor to decide what to do. So this is where the discretion comes in. The prosecutor has to make a decision whether to prosecute, okay? Now, if you look at the Constitution of the Republic of Singapore, uh, it states that the Attorney General 
shall have power exercisable at his discretion to institute, conduct, or discontinue any proceedings. Okay, so institute, conduct, or discontinue. And this, this power is exercisable at his discretion. Then the Criminal Procedure Code says that the Attorney General shall be the public prosecutor and, and shall have control and direction of criminal prosecutions. So when you look at these two provisions, you see that the AG has discretion and the AG is the public prosecutor. Now, you also know that the Attorney General is the chief law officer of the country. The Attorney General is also a legal advisor to the government. So therein you start to see the potential conflict, right? On the one hand, you have the Attorney General being the government's uh, lawyer. And then on the other hand, the Attorney General is also the public prosecutor who is expected to act independently. Okay, so that's the conflict or a potential conflict that we have to be very, very careful about. Now, why is it that there is a discretion? So some people ask, look, if someone has complained about a crime, and if the police have investigated and they find that there is evidence of a crime, then shouldn't a prosecution automatically follow? The answer is no. Okay? And the reasons for this discretion is to enable the prosecution to deliver individualized justice. Okay? It also lends itself to, to efficiency and flexibility. So let me quickly explain what I mean here. Uh, take your classic example, right? You have a young person who goes out, uh, does something silly, uh, and maybe ends up stealing some small value items from a shop, bravado, being challenged by the peers, and so on. Now, that person is caught by the storekeeper and a police report is made. Should we automatically prosecute this person or should we have some discretion to perhaps warn the person, give them a second chance? So that discretion becomes very, very important. It also serves efficiency. If you have to prosecute every crime that is reported, the system will be overburdened. And thirdly, it gives some flexibility because it allows us to be a little bit creative in our criminal justice system. So we might say in some cases, yes, a crime has been committed and yes, we need to do something about this, but perhaps we don't want to prosecute the person and instead we want to divert the person. So send them off for perhaps uh, some kind of rehabilitation or some sort of treatment if the person has a mental disorder. So the discretion facilitates all of that. The scope of the discretion also is very, very broad. And remember, Article 35A says that it is to institute, conduct, or discontinue. So it's right across the range. Um, the most important part of it is the decision to charge. Do you charge or not? What charge do you select? Um, but it is also very important in other aspects, right? Uh, particularly in terms of the duty to disclose. And in fact, in Singapore, there are a few cases now where the, the prosecution's conduct in terms of not disclosing some information has come under scrutiny. Um, you know, coincidentally, just today, if you go and look, on, look at the internet, there are two uh, uh, media stories floating around, uh, one involving a, an alleged non-disclosure by the prosecution and another uh, challenging the uh, attorney general's standing to participate because of the potential conflict between the role of the attorney general and the role of the public prosecutor. And that's, that's, that's right today, right? That's right today. Uh, so this, this, is, this is really a, a, an area that is very much alive um, and it feeds into the core of justice, democracy, the rule of law, and so on. Okay? There are a few other areas which I'm not going to go into, but this just gives you a flavor of the strength of this of this discretion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, in terms of the charging uh, decision itself, right, the way the discretion is, is applied is that the prosecution must be satisfied that there is sufficient evidence, okay? Because you don't want to simply accuse people of crimes if the evidence is flimsy, right? So the prosecution must first review the file and make a decision, okay, is there sufficient evidence? Now, so that's the easy part. Right? So if there's not sufficient evidence to say, no, we don't proceed. The difficult part is if there's sufficient evidence, 
you can still choose not to prosecute if it is in the public interest. Okay, so that's a, that's a value judgment that the prosecution must make. I have sufficient evidence to prosecute, but is it really in the public interest? Should I prosecute in this case, right? So that gives a lot of discretion and potential for inconsistency. So that's the one area where we have to be very, very careful. Okay, so I'll come back to, to the discretion in the, in the third part of my presentation. Um, let me now set up again another part of the research, which is very interesting, is the role of the public prosecutor, right? I've already set out that the public prosecutor is the attorney general. And so there's a potential conflict there between the role of the attorney general as the principal legal advisor to the government and the role of the attorney general as the public prosecutor who's meant to be independent. Okay, so that's one thing when we leave that aside. The other thing is that again, the public prosecutor in making these prosecutorial decisions has to take into account the interests of multiple stakeholders, right? You are enforcing the criminal law. So you of course have to think about the community, right? Safety to the community, community interests, community must have trust that the criminal laws are being enforced. You have to think in terms of the state. The state has legislated, they expect the law to be enforced. You cannot undermine that too much by using discretion to not enforce the legislative will. You have to think of the victim, the victim of a crime. Again, in today's paper, it's, it's amazing how <laughs> alive these issues are. Uh, there is a, um, um, a woman who has complained about the sentence that was given to the perpetrator who seriously injured her child. So she was taking care of the child and she seriously injured the child, but the sentence was not adequate. Okay, so here the victim says, I want a more harsh penalty. Now, how does the public prosecutor make submissions on sentencing? You can't just pander to the victim, right? Equal, because you must also be fair to the defendant. So the public prosecutor has multiple stakeholders that they have to uh, keep in mind in trying to make these decisions. Now, another aspect of, of the, the prosecutor's work is that the public prosecutor in common law jurisdictions like Singapore is working in an adversarial system. So what do we mean by an adversarial system? It means when things go to court, the judges act as neutral referees, right? They just watch the contest between the two parties. So if it's a criminal case, it will be the prosecution against the defense counsel. Now, in most litigation, you have two parties who have gone to court and they fight each other and the lawyers do the best to win for their client. That's the main role, right? They want to win for the client. But the public prosecutor is representing the state against an individual. There's a big difference there in power, number one. Number two, the primary objective of the public prosecutor is to ensure that justice is done. So that's why I say the public prosecutor wears a minister of justice role. So they can't go in there as gladiators or just battling to win in the court. They have to go there to ensure that justice is done, which is why, for example, all of this applies to all uh, litigation, the public prosecution has an obligation to disclose information to the other side, even information that might not help their case. They have to disclose it because if there's a possibility that someone is innocent, then they should not be found guilty. And the public prosecutor should never have an interest in finding innocent people guilty, right? So the public prosecutor here is acting as a minister of justice, but they're operating within an adversarial system. So again, you see, there are these internal conflicts. Okay, um, if you look at how the prosecutorial discretion can be safeguarded, right? When you look at international trends, you see that there is a move towards having additional legislative oversight by having legislation that uh, controls the powers of the prosecutor and that sets up rules or codes of conduct that the prosecutor has to 
abide by. So that's, that's one. The other big development is that in many jurisdictions, the prosecution is separated out under a director of public prosecutions rather than under the attorney general. The, the attorney general continues to have a supervisory role, but is not directly involved. So that creates that independence for the Office of Public Prosecutions. And thirdly, many jurisdictions have also developed prosecution guidelines. So this helps prosecutors decide cases in a consistent manner. And it also lends to transparency in decision-making, particularly if the guidelines are published. Okay, so how important are guidelines? Well, again, this is a matter that is debated. Some, some countries are strongly in favor of it, and some of them even have legislated and given them the, the, almost the, the, the force of law. They mandate that prosecutors must abide by guidelines. Uh, some countries do not have guidelines, or at least they do not publish the guidelines while they may have internal guidelines. So in Singapore, uh, there are internal guidelines, but the guidelines are not published. And again, that raises interesting questions for researchers to look at in terms of transparency of criminal justice, in terms of how the public prosecutors' policy choices and the legislators' policy choices might interact. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so so that's, that's, that's another aspect of this, right? The, the, the guidelines. Now, coming to the um, final part of my, my presentation. How do you exercise oversight over the prosecutor's exercise of discretion? Well, the main way is through judicial review. So you can go to court. You can go to court. However, the scope for judicial review of prosecutorial decisions is very, very narrow. And there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, in, in Singapore, it is limited really to two grounds, abuse of power. So you have to show that the public prosecutor acted in bad faith or breach of constitutional rights. So for example, uh, you can show that the public prosecutor didn't treat two offenders equally. So that violates article 12 of the constitution that guarantees equal treatment. So those are the only two grounds on which you can review the public prosecutor's exercise of discretion. Um, two other important points to note are that the court will generally presume that the prosecution has exercised its discretion lawfully. So it's for the accused person to uh, demonstrate that the prosecution has not exercised its discretion. And that again raises some constitutional questions, right? In terms of your right to liberty and freedom, why is it that the burden should be on the uh, accused person rather than on the prosecution. And the public prosecutor is also not under any obligation to give reasons. Okay, so this again has raised questions amongst the public. So why can't the prosecution explain why they chose to prosecute or why they chose not to prosecute? In fact, right now in Singapore, it's a very, very high profile case um, where the prosecution's conduct and police conduct are being reviewed. Um, but again, this is not a simple or straightforward issue. Because if the prosecution has chosen not to prosecute because, let's say, the victim of the crime doesn't want to proceed, then it would be unfair on the victim to publicize everything, right? If the prosecution is choosing not to proceed because there is not sufficient evidence, then again, it's not fair on the defense to go out and say, oh, well, we could have prosecuted, but we weren't sure, because that taints the defendant. So there are reasons why you shouldn't disclose. Having said that, there are some cases where it is highly controversial or sensitive and the community has become deeply engaged. It may be helpful to explain the decision in order to be transparent. Okay, so the, let, me, let me come to the, some concluding remarks um, and then hopefully we can take some, some questions so I can hear your comments. So, the independence of the public prosecutor is essential. Okay, you cannot have a situation where the public prosecutor is controlled by the government, where you can prosecute, for example, people you don't like or not prosecute your friends and colleagues. That would be unacceptable. 
That, that's number one. Number two, the discretion is very, very important in order to maintain a flexible, efficient, and compassionate system of criminal justice. So yes, you do need that. So you do need the independence, you do need the discretion. But they create a number of challenges. The discretion is exercised behind closed doors. The prosecutor does not have to explain the decision. And the decision is largely protected from judicial review. So how do you then go about um, getting that balance right? So, so this is just a very, very quick overview at the, at the sort of big picture level of some of the uh, themes of my research into public prosecution and also to try and demonstrate how relevant uh, this type of research can be, because this really impacts on all of us as individual citizens of a country, right? This can be looked at through the lens, not just of criminal law, but through constitutional law, right? Uh, what are your rights as a, as a citizen? How does the rule of law operate to constrain state power? Who at the end of the day should uh, be in charge. So I just want to close by using um, the um, Aladdin as, 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 a, as, a, as a metaphor, as an allegory. Here. So if you try and imagine it, right, in, in the Aladdin cartoon, you have the genie who is all powerful, right? Uh, so if you look at the prosecutor as the genie who is all powerful, then you want to remember that the genie is nevertheless confined to the lamp. So you should look at the lamp as the rule of law, but the prosecutor with all his or her powers must still be confined by the rule of law. And so who's Aladdin in this? Well, Aladdin should be the people, democracy. At the end of the day, Aladdin controls the lamp, and the people must control the rule of law and the prosecutor. So that's just my little strange ending, but I hope, I hope the, the, the the substance of, of the talk uh, has, has raised some interest uh, in you, both in terms of pursuing perhaps a PhD in law uh, at NUS, but also just your own general interest and curiosity as to the role of the public prosecutor and the importance of criminal justice um, in, in whatever countries that you are in at the moment. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kumar. Um, at this point, I think we'll open up to questions from the floor. So if there are any sort of any questions, reactions or comments, uh, please feel free to either post in the Q&A box or to uh, raise your hands and I can unmute you. Um, if there, there aren't any questions, I, I thought maybe I, I would slip in one of my own, which is to kind of um, uh, I think in thinking about, you know, um, uh, students who might be very interested in the stuff you're working on and thinking about potentially doing a law degree, um, sorry, a law PhD, to what extent do you, uh, do you have to have a law degree in order to pursue this, um, to pursue a, a PhD in law in, in, at NUS? No, not, no, strictly, no, you do not. Um, mm -hmm. um, but of course, I think we would have to look very closely at the topic. Uh, we have admitted uh, students who don't have a law background uh, to do the PhD. Yeah. So it really depends on the on the thesis topic and their suitability to do it. And in the process, would one typically uh, acquire, uh, obtain a law degree as part of the PhD? Um, or is that kind of completely separate? No, it's completely separate. So the professional degree is the LLB, mm -hmm. uh, which is the bachelor's degree. And that's the one that's the law degree which you can use for practice purposes and so on. The master's degree and the PhD are not professional degrees. I see, interesting. And um, I, I know in like some other countries, it's, it's quite common or at least depending on the uh, thesis topic of interest or research topic of interest that you know sometimes they might pursue, for example, a, a joint degree in economics and law or maybe even law and medicine if you're very interested in medical litigation, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, are those sort of the possible um, avenues that students should be thinking about or um, and, and how does it typically work in, in these sorts of uh, arrangements? Oh, you're talking at the PhD level? At the PhD level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we strongly encourage cross-disciplinary work uh, and, and, and most PhDs tend to be cross-disciplinary in law because you're looking at the specialist areas, so you tend to be looking at it in terms of commercial or business or economic or political uh, contexts, right? Uh, so definitely that would be that, 
that, that would be pretty much the norm. Um, so the, the main supervisor would be at the law school. Um, and uh, sometimes you can have advisors in the law school. Because the law school itself is quite cross-disciplinary. Uh, so for example, I do a lot of work in medical law, medical ethics. Um, you know, many of my colleagues will be doing a lot of work in the commercial area. Um, if we have economists in the faculty, philosophers. Um, so the law school itself has got that sort of rich body of potential supervisors, but we're also very open to having advisors from other faculties. So that's not, not a problem at all. Um, in fact, for example, there's a, there's a PhD candidate at the medical school, uh, and I'm on the, one of the committees for that because it's a law and medicine PhD. Uh, and so that's something that we would certainly, uh, we would certainly welcome and encourage. Yeah, and it's very interesting because I think you know sort of one of the other developments in the in the PhD program more generally in US is also to encourage more of this interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary kind of uh, arrangements, and so I think the faculties work quite closely uh, to facilitate some of these uh, um, arrangements. Um, I will make a, another appeal to see if there are any other questions. If not, I might. Uh, um, continue to um, to 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 to, to um, um, ask you a couple of questions that sort of popped in my mind as I listen to your talk. Um, so I think if there are no questions, and I'll indulge myself if you don't mind. Um, so I mean, one of the things that I've been quite intrigued, especially as you've mentioned, with all these um, you know media interests uh, um, in in various specific cases, is kind of in thinking about the public prosecutor. What is the role of like the district the district court, so sort of the sub courts and the supreme court? I mean, both sets of courts will also have their own sets of uh, public prosecutors and I guess I'm trying to think about you know as someone a private citizen navigating this and thinking about you know sort of the different levels of separation like what is the relationship between sort of these different uh, uh, different avenues of um, justice if you, if you may. Okay so the levels of court okay mm -hmm. so we have so in Singapore you have the there's the, the court system I suppose is, is there are two bits to it so you've got the state courts and then the supreme court which is on top of that um, and the Supreme Court is made up of the High Court and the Court of Appeal. The state courts are made up of well, mainly the District Court and the Magistrates Court, and then a whole host of other specialist courts um, mm -hmm. that are within the state court system, including the Community Court, the Sharia Court, and so on, right? Now, for criminal matters, uh, the majority of the criminal cases will go through the state courts, mm -hmm. right? So we're looking at the uh, Magistrates court or district court. Okay, so most of the stuff was taking place there. The most serious crimes will be prosecuted in the high court. So we're mm. talking crimes like murder, uh, sexual assault, uh, some of the most serious commercial crimes, they will, they will be initiated in the high court. Otherwise, most of your crimes um, will, will be prosecuted in the, in, the, in the lower courts. Now, then of course, there is the avenue for appeal so you can have a magistrate's appeal to the high court. Uh, and then if it's a high court case, then you can have a high court appeal to the court of appeal. So the system of appeals is open to anyone basically who would like to kind of um, uh, to, to appeal a, a decision that's made at a lower court. Yeah, so, so there, are, there are rules about uh, when parties can appeal. Um, um, generally, it'll be on, on the basis of a question of law, mm -hmm. but for criminal cases, you, 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 you have a right of appeal. So if you've been convicted and you want to appeal against your conviction or your sentence, you have the right to do so. Uh, and similarly, the prosecution also has the right uh, to appeal. To appeal as well, I see. So it's, it's, it's both sides, really. That's right. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So there are some countries which uh, prohibit that. So some countries say prosecution shouldn't appeal against an acquittal. Mm. Um, just to say that, you know, you, you've already had a go. Um, and if the lower court has acquitted the accused person, then you shouldn't have another go in a higher court. Um, uh, but they will allow appeals against sentences. And sometimes in the countries where they don't allow appeals against convictions, they may allow what they call academic appeals, because the prosecution says, look, there's a very important point of law that we need a higher court to rule on so they can appeal it, but it doesn't affect the outcome. So the acquitted person will not be convicted regardless of the outcome of the appeal. Interesting. 
Thank you very much uh, for answering my question. Um, so I, I think that uh, we've, we've come to the end of the session. Uh, thank you again for a, a very interesting and inspiring talk. And um, um, again, I think the students who are out there who are listening to, to the talk today, I urge you to kind of, uh, you know, uh, sort of consider um, law as being something that you might be potentially interested in. And I think uh, one of the things, common threads across, I think, all this because th this evening is really how much interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary angles there are. So even though these seem like very specialized PhDs to some extent, uh, they really at the, at the graduate level are actually a lot more diverse in terms of the uh, uh, topics of interest, uh, both of uh, faculty and potential projects. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof Kumar, for taking time um, uh, to, 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 to be with us this evening. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for including me.